One of the real highlights of our annual conference is that the Bogleheads get a chance to have their questions answered directly by Vanguard founder Jack Bogle. This year's moderator of the Q&A with Jack is a retired Mobile Oil Corporation human resource executive. He discovered the Bogleheads in 2001, and he and his wife Patty attended their first Bogleheads conference in Denver in 2004. They've both been active in the Bogleheads community since that time. They live in Northern Virginia area and started the Washington, D.C. area Bogleheads local chapter. Please welcome my good friend and conference teammate, Ed Rager. And please give another very warm welcome to our very special guest of honor, Mr. Jack Bogle. For me. And now, with, without further ado, let's get started with the Q&A. Take it in. Just let me say one quick thing. Uh, I spoke at the NASD. I had a big, long speech. NASD, National Association of Securities Dealers, in Washington about a decade ago. And when I was introduced, they gave me a standing ovation. And I looked at the audience and said, why didn't you say that till after I spoke? <laughs> We know uh, this crowd loves you, and that's why we're here. So you'll probably get another one before the day's <laughs> out. So. Okay, so I've got a number of questions, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, this first one is from an attendee named Fred Beery. It says, the market has been up for years, and I have gained more than I expected. In setting up a donor advisor fund for charitable giving, over the next, say, 10 years. What allocation would you suggest between U.S. equities, bonds, dare I ask international, <laughs> to maximize the returns for the charities I've given to? Well, first of all, if you're going to have a balanced program, uh, which is what you laid out there, uh, you're not going to maximize your return. The best way to maximize your return is, is to, in the long run, maybe not from here, is to buy the S&P 500 and leverage it. Uh, and you don't want to do that. But the prudent thing, so the, the real question is not to get maximum returns, but what is the best way to get prudent returns? And I, you know, I, I would stick with the balanced index fund formula of 60% uh, stocks and 40% bonds. And maybe for a program like this, 65%. But you really can't make an argument over 65 or 60 because nobody knows and God knows Bogle doesn't know. Uh, so uh, should international non-US be in that 60%? I don't think you need it and I don't think the rest of the world will do as well as the US. But I'm wrong so often in my new book I spend more time talking about the things I did wrong than the things I did right. So it's a matter of judgment. And uh, I'd say maybe to, to honor the principle uh, let's call it Taylor's principle, the free fund portfolio, you might have 10% to 20% of the stock position, no more than that, in non-U.S. stocks. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next one is from added Adam Manwarren. Uh, since attending the Bogleheads Conference for the first time last year, I've been quickly moving my asset allocation toward Taylor Laramore's three fund portfolio. Recently, I've been lured into the Vanguard Active Alpha Seeking ETFs. After rereading your article on reversion to the mean, am I just chasing my tail with that active ETF bet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that answer is fairly clear. <laughs> so Adam, listen up. Uh, this next one is from Trey Parrish. As a retiree in mid-retirement, given your lower projections for stock market returns over the next 10 years, should I reduce, reduce my stock exposure in my portfolio since CD rates are rising and becoming more attractive? And how can I determine the appropriate stock allocation? 
Well, you know, I've said before, this is a really hard time to invest. I would say, as a general principle, with the stock market at these levels, it is probably a good idea to, as, as Marin Rothschild said, to sell to the sleeping point, to sell stocks where you're not worried about it. Maybe a 10% re percentage point reduction in the stock position. Maybe not. What makes this time so different is that bond yields are so low, and they're going up, admittedly. The Treasury is up to, I think, Someone said 3.2%, 25-year Treasury, 30-year Treasury, and uh, the stock market is 1.8, so you get a higher yield. But these are not really super yields, and uh, so uh, it's a it's a, it's a really not a question, that, an easy question to answer, because it depends not only on your ability to withstand a market decline, uh, your financial ability, but on your emotional ability to stand the market. So you're you're asking me to do not only a financial analy analysis but a psychological analysis, which I'm not prepared to do on the in, in on the on the information contained in one or two sentences. But I would say there is, you the biggest mistake investors make is when they think the market is high, they get out, they go to zero. That is the dumbest thing you can possibly do because there's no certainty in this. So in my book, which I think. You know, so I've signed so many, I don't feel um, feel badly about blacking it a little bit. Um, little book of common sense investing. And I say never have less than 25% of it in equities and never more. Now, there are exceptions to both of those, but I would kind of stick to that. Just make sure you've got a decent position. And I would think today would probably be a time to make a very, if, if, if this is the way the investor feels, this makes you more comfortable, makes you sleep better. To do some kind of a five or ten percentage point reduction, so if he's at sixty-five percent, to go to sixty or sixty-five, of uh, sixty or fifty-five, excuse me, uh, and uh, but there's no I, I don't know how to get across. People ask me these kinds of questions all the time. There's no certainty about this. Uh, you know, you can be so terribly wrong uh, that you don't want to do anything too big. But in general, I'd say if you're at sixty forty. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I happen to be 50-50 myself. I told you that yesterday. And I spent half my time wondering why I have so much in stocks and the other half wondering why I have so little. Uh, the investor's dilemma, I think I call it. Uh, but it's, it's, it gets to, presumably the financial ability to withstand risk is there and the emotional ability there. You have to add, the investor has to ask for himself. But if you're really bothered, really scared, do something. I mean, life is too short. Uh, but are there precise answers to the question? No, there aren't precise answers to anything in the field of investing. Okay. This is from Duncan Rankin. If all of your portfolio is inside Roth IRAs, is it better to use Taylor's three fund portfolio or use an equivalent target date or life strategy fund? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Uh, you know, the target date is an interesting uh, kind of an idea. Uh, your equities go uh, down as your age goes up. Uh, your bonds go up as your age goes up. And uh, Taylor's three fund portfolio is presumably a buy and hold. And that could easily, uh, could easily do better, but could easily do worse. There's just no way that I can think of. You'd have a balanced portfolio in any event. And uh, there's no way that I could predict which will do better. Uh, but if it were me, uh, we are a funny, funny crowd, these investors, we investors. Uh, I, I would do the simple portfolio rather than the complex portfolio. Now, that means you don't have as much fun game playing. You know, you, it's kind of boring to have all your money in the balanced index fund. Uh, you know, what do you do? Well, you don't look at it once a year, maybe, and uh, take it from there. So there's just uh, kind of, as the old saying goes, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? And uh, that's how much you should have in one or the other. I just can't answer the question. Okay. This is from Meryl Moore. Uh, what is the single best piece of advice or lesson that you want to pass on to your heirs? I'm thinking. <laughs> well, it's a very hard question because 
getting when you get into a, a presumed investment advice or not? Just says single best piece of advice or lesson. Well, the obvious thing that the best single advice is never lose your humanity. Be a good human being. Now, presumably, this this is actually aimed at at an investment. What do you do about investing? And a single word, I'd say, um, minimize costs. And start early. That's the second second piece of advice. And never never stop your regular investment program, no matter whether times are good or bad. I mentioned low cost. Uh, be diversified. And now I've gone over the single <laughs> piece of advice. It all counts. This is from uh, Dion Stams. Uh, I like the statement that. Quote, in theory, practice and theory are the same, but in practice they are not, end of quote. Do you have advice for us managing our portfolios on the difference between theory and practice? Well, let me say a couple of things about that. You know, I read a lot of the financial analysts' journal articles and a lot of the journal of portfolio management articles, and I can understand about 15 to 20 percent of them. They've got all these Greek formulas and uh, they make things very complicated and they're looking backward always. Uh, so they're doing a lot of data, data mining. If you look backward and see something that doesn't work, you throw it in the ash can and find something that does work. And believe me, if you do enough data mining, uh, you can find a lot of things that work. Uh, in the past, that have worked in the past, <laughs> I should say. So, a lot of the theory out there, I think, is cast in a very misleading and foolish light. Uh, doesn't allow for costs. Uh, it doesn't talk about what strategies you should have once you do invest. Uh, and there's there's this uh, back testing, as it's called, that, that leaves me uh, dubious about theory. Indeed, I wonder if anybody who writes these academic theory articles has ever followed his own advice. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> and uh, so, practice, I would favor over theory. Uh, but, you know, if you want to tell me that theory, gross return minus cost equals net return, I would follow that. <laughs> uh, you know, is that a formula? Is that a theory? Is that a practice? It's certainly a practice. And it's certainly a theory, too. There's this old saying about, uh, it works in practice, why the heck doesn't it work in theory? <laughs> An interesting question. And uh, there's two, there's, I think there's much too much, much too much, kind of the search for the holy grail uh, in, in investing, the search for the market beating, consistently market beating formula, uh, without the knowledge that, as far as I know, in, in human history, the Holy Grail does not exist. So you don't want to spend an awful lot more time looking for it. Okay, next from Newolf. i got to put my glasses on. <clears throat> Newolf Fellenbaum, I'm sorry for the name pronouncing. Uh, at what age did you introduce your kids to financial literacy concepts, and what methods did you find most effective? Well, I did it very differently. First, and, and you know, you can't answer that question very well because all kids are different. And uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, my um, oldest son happens to be a hedge fund manager. I mean, a market neutral hedge fund manager. He does very well for his clients and himself, unbelievably, because his fees are very low. Uh, and. Uh, he was kind of restless and not fun, not getting much interest. This is when he was, say, 16, and not getting much interest in the world. So I said, why don't you take a look at the stock market, John, and uh, I'll pick out a couple of stocks for you. You can pick out a couple of stocks that you like and follow them and see what happens. We aren't going to buy them, just put them on paper. So he picked out about four stocks, and I didn't know how successful that advice was until I went into his bedroom one evening, and there they were all on little letters on his lampshade. <laughs> so that was a, it was a way to get somebody interested in investing. Uh, and, you know, I, I detest these um, 
contests um, that schools and colleges have among, among kids to see who can pick the best portfolio and all that, and all that because it suggests that that's the way you should invest. But that's just a game. That doesn't have anything to do with real investing. <laughs> so uh, at what age is a kid able enough, and again, all, all children are going to be different, able enough to understand uh, the, the essential message that I give? And I should tell you that for 25 years, so let's use that one, probably the oldest, you know, the, the oldest child. Uh, well, the children probably, they're now in their, well, two, two of them had their 60th birthday. God, am I that old? <laughs> <laughs> so probably when they got into their early 20s, late teens, uh, I told them I was going to put some money away for them every year, and I was going to put it in Vanguard Balanced Index Fund. And that's a, yeah, I did, and part of it's an administrative convenience. You know, I've got six kids, 12 grandchildren, Many great grandchildren. Um, I guess six great grandchildren. Is that right, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I told you I relied on Mike for a lot. <laughs> and uh, so, probably in their late teens or 20s. And I told them what I was going to do was put it in a balanced index fund, told them what that meant. It wouldn't go up as much as the market, but it wouldn't go down. And you didn't have to worry about it. And then every once in a while, a news clipping would come along. And I used one of them in my book, Little Book of Common Sense Investing. It showed how well the balance fund had done, balance index fund, which didn't very sensational at all, but it had beaten the, the college endowment funds. I think it's very close to the chart that Gus Sorter showed you a little while ago. And so I said to you, know, just don't do anything. Well, I, I put it away. They just in trust. They won't get it for I guess I like cork, I can't remember. No, they don't even get it then. <laughs> then their parents become the trustees and then they can draw capital if they want to buy a new house or something like that or put a down payment down on a new house. But you would be amazed at, uh, I won't give you the numbers, but putting a large kind of gift that I can afford to do every year, year after year, for 25 years. Wow. My these damn kids are rich. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I don't give them valuations. I don't talk about it. I want them to make their own way in financial life. And uh, when I cork, they're going to be very, very happy grandchildren. Uh, but um, I won't be there to hear the laughter, I guess. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Steve Floyd wants to know if the U.S. stock market suddenly went into an unexpected broad market decline of greater than 25% and still heading south, what would you tell us to help us stay the course? Well, the first thing I'd say was, who the heck knows whether it's still heading south? <laughs> it may have stopped going down at 25%, and a lot of them do start stopping the 20-25% range. But, you know, it's an opportunity to buy more, and certainly, you know, there are a lot of funny ways of, uh, it's not very hard to give advice on these kind of things. But the one piece of advice I would categorically give to everybody, for God's sake, don't stop a program of regular investing because the market goes down. You're killing the whole value of dollar cost averaging, and it may go down for a few more years. Who really knows? But so, so much the better when you're putting money in every month, because it will come back. Uh, I think we're in a little dangerous territory now, as I, as I tell people. Uh, but and the twenty-five percent drop, thirty-five percent drop is easily possible. It's always possible, just because markets are markets. So I think the questioner is right to say, you know, how, what should I do? And I guess the answer generally is, um, don't do something. Just stand there. This is from Kathleen Ryan. Uh, what was the best advice you received from each of your parents? That was a long time ago. Uh, you know, I should remember, but I 
you know, they always wanted me to do what was right. Uh, we placed a high value on telling the truth, uh, which would be a kind of an integrity related thing. Um, we, they were taught, we were taught uh, to behave like honorable human beings, uh, but I can't remember any specific piece of advice that we got. Well, I would think that everyone in this room, in this room and around the world, would agree that you've done every one of those things. <laughs> I, I hope so. Try my best. <coughs> Yvette Sir Lucho, again, forgive me on the pronunciation. What are your thoughts on ways a new retiree can protect their portfolio from inflation? Well, protecting yourself from inflation in the, in the stock market is a very difficult thing. There is very little correlation, over, even over intermediate term periods, with stock prices and inflation. There is a direct correlation, a very high correlation, between dividend payments and inflation. And those lines almost overlap each other. Curiously enough, I, had, I think I had one of those charts in that ancient Princeton thesis. Um, but dividends are highly correlated. And I think we should spend more time thinking about dividends rather than market values, uh, because market values are all over the place, and dividends are pretty reliable to go up a little bit each year, like inflation is. And now, someone mentioned the other day, I think it was Jonathan, maybe, uh, that there, in, in 19, mm, what was that year, 1979 or 80, uh, dividends went down 22% on the S&P 500. That's an extraordinary event. It was the biggest decline in dividends since 1929, 1933. So, you know, it just doesn't happen over and over again. And in that case, what was most extraordinary about it, it didn't reflect a general drop in dividends. It reflected the elimination of dividends by almost all the banks. They had to stop paying their dividends. So I wouldn't give that much credence. I think dividends are fairly secure, and you should be worried not about the value of uh, of your estate, but about the income producing capacity of the state of, of your estate or your retirement plan. Uh, because that's where you go out, you know, once a month you go out to the mailbox and get your mutual fund dividends and your social security check, and then you come home and have a nice dinner, live in a nice house, whatever else you want to do. Uh, so it's, it's, we should focus, I really believe this so strongly. We should focus more on the inherent value of our investment program than on the market value. Because markets are crazy things, and that's what makes investing so difficult. And if you want to look at it that way, so much fun. This is from John Allen. Uh, I would like to know more about you as an individual. What do you like to do that is not related to investing? And what places... Do you and your family find most enjoyable to visit? Well, I hate those questions. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, in fact, kind of a jerk. And that is, I have gotten so wrapped up in my career and my crusade and my mission uh, that I am not nearly as well balanced a human being as I, as I should be. Uh, you know, I read try and read three or four good books a year when someone that has a good good education, which I certainly got, should be worth reading a dozen books a year. Uh, I do read The New Yorker. That's my one claim to, to uh, omniscient, uh, omnibus kind of reading. And it's, it's a great magazine, greatly written, and great subject matter. You just can't, you can't beat it. But a few books a year, and I'm talking about good books. I mean, I, I sometimes throw in a junk book. Um, I read The Woman in the Window, that popular book of a few years ago. Still not quite sure what happened at the end. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, and of course, now I'm not the man I used to be. And don't say, no, you never were. Uh, the, uh, but I, I can't do much in the way of battle. I used to play a lot of tennis, squash. Uh, had to pick up golf after I had my first heart attack, which was 19, well, 31 years old. I guess that was 1960. And so I had to give up the racket sports. And then I finally found a doctor who said, get back to racket sports, uh, which was nice. Although it turned out to be something I shouldn't be doing with my peculiar form of heart disease. Uh, I actually collapsed once on the squash court and died. And uh, 
my opponent didn't know what to do. He ran to the, you may have heard this story, he ran to the locker room, the guy that said, call for help, Mr. Bogle is down, I think he's, he's dead. And then, and the guy said, well, yeah, I don't, we don't really have a system for that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the guy came back and went clunk, 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 as hard as he could in my heart. And that turns out to be quite a brilliant thing to do, particularly in that case, because it actually started. And when, they, when the emergency people got there, they said, do you think you need to go to a hospital? <laughs> You can't make this stuff up, right, Mike? <laughs> and I said, yeah, probably a good idea. <laughs> but uh, so I, I can't do the athletic things. I, I have a lot of, you, you can see it here. I can't do even much walking now. I, I'm very shaky in my balance. I'm taking some physical therapy. I hope it will get better. But time is not on my, not, not on my side. But, um, you know, I think, I think my kids would tell you I've been a good father. Uh, and you can, all, you can be a good father uh, in my fashion uh, by, I always thought my job was not to lecture the kids, but to show them how I behaved. So they weren't saying when something happened, you didn't tell, you told us not to do that, daddy. <laughs> uh, we don't get much of that because I tried to live to the standards that I would have lectured them on. And uh, so we're, we're close in a lot of ways, uh, children, grandchildren. I have a very happy, nicest thing for a family is to have the cousins all interact to, to what, together. And we, we don't do that 100%, but we do it a very high percentage. We all get together and we have great times as a family. Uh, so I don't feel too guilty. But the prime reason that I was able to be a less than perfect father, or less than, a, you know, I was, I don't know how to explain this, but you get consumed with a mission, and uh, you also get a reputation and sometimes I think half of my life is spent trying to live up to my reputation <laughs> uh, and this I think is not uncommon at all it's sort of like uh, Adam Smith in the invisible spectator is it invisible impartial. impartial spectator thank you Mike I depend on him for every impartial spectator and you, you've read about that in some of my works and you'll read a little bit about it in my new book uh, but I have a fantastic wife uh, she was a great mother, is a great mother, great grandmother. Uh, she's a complete workhorse. And now she has, she's about five years younger than I am. And uh, now she has the task of taking care of this poor, doddering old fool. And, uh, you know, it's hard for me to get around the house even. So she really steps up to the plate and does that too. One more task. Um, she's in charge of me and the dogs. <laughs> so I, you know, I, don't, I don't need to make this too apologetic. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, if you had to do over again, would you do it differently? No, why the hell would I do it differently? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with what I've done, uh, in a small way proud of what I've done. And uh, a lot of it's because of people like you in this room. You know, the people that have been helped by my simple ideas and uh, I'd say my higher, high moral values. You mentioned your book. Uh, there was a question. We're eager to read your new book. Is it coming out in November? It's, I think so. That's <laughs> uh, really funny. Uh, if you can stand a little byplay here. Um, Mike has been the lead horse and tried to get all the proofs done and all that. And <clears throat> we got the final proofs. And uh, I looked at them over the weekend, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we only had four days to look at them. And I decided that chapter 17 should not be chapter 17. It should be three different chapters, 17, 18, and 19. So I separated the three, rewrote the third, and brought it in on Monday morning. And I thought Michael was going to faint. <laughs> and I thought the editor, Wiley, was going to die. Uh, so I turned that over to Mike to deal with it. <laughs> and uh, it's a better book because of it. But uh, it, it didn't hold up the publication, the reason I mentioned it here. So it should be out around November 15th. The note on Amazon says November 29th. But that's a special, I think, distribution problem for Amazon. And 
as it's, you know, I read you that part that I like so much of it. You, me, and the universe. I'm sorry, the universe, you and me. Uh, and, uh, no, it was you, me, and the universe. Got my alphabet wrong. Under why? Uh, and, uh, so there's a lot of moralizing in it. And, you know, increasingly, uh, I find that life is kind of simple. Uh, draw on your humanity. Uh, try and get the hell out of this world as a decent human being. And, uh, you know, if been, you've been lucky in your education, in your family, uh, family that I grew up with and the family that I have now, and have also had a career that's mounted to more than nothing, uh, I don't know, I shouldn't be satisfied, and I will never be totally satisfied, but I, I, I feel pretty good about my life so far. So far. <laughs> Okay, Bob Ronan wants to know, <clears throat> do you think bobbleheads are too thrifty so that they end up leaving too much money for someone else to spend? <laughs> Should we splurge a little more? Say, say that once again, I missed the middle. The, do you think we end up <clears throat> leaving too much money for someone else to spend? Should we splurge a little bit more? Well, you're, you've asked that question of the cheapest guy in the United States. <laughs> I hate shopping. Uh, I don't even go into a store. I get most of my stuff, including everything I'm wearing at this moment, from L.L. Bean, uh, because they, they have like a little catalog. <laughs> and you just check off a few things or call them by phone, and they send them to you. It's, it's kind of wonderful. And they're, they're not very expensive. But... Uh, yeah, everything. I mean, I, I, I give away. I don't know if I really should say this, but I will tell you it's the truth. Uh, I might take a couple of families out to dinner, and I get worried about the bill. Do you really have to have steak? What's the matter with chicken? <laughs> I, no, I don't say that, but I think that. Uh, you really need a salad course? Yeah, nice big dinner. What's this about dessert? And, yeah, I can give a very large donation to a charity and not even think about it. Not even think about it. So, that's kind of weird. But it's a lot, it's a lot more fun to give away to people, to people that have less than you do uh, than, you know, getting accustomed to high way of living, going out for dinner, for example. And we, we'd like to, sort of. Although we have this nice place in Lake Placid. Very nice. We've been there for 50 years now. And bought by my wife's parents. And uh, if I ever say to the kids up there, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? They always say, if it's nicer than it is here, <laughs> and we don't go out for dinner. And no place on earth nicer than that. We also had a <coughs> multiple questions from people out on the Boglehead website that weren't able to attend. And I thought I wanted to mix some of those into the questions as well. Um, and to start off with one, uh, Kim, what major changes or trends do you foresee coming in the next decade or two? Well, I'll, I'll give you, with reasonable brevity, uh, the three that I write out of the book. Uh, chapter 17 is now part two, with three chapters. And the chapter, the parts, the, uh, three of the book is called the future of investment management. And the three chapters are number one, the mutualization of the mutual fund industry. And there's no way that at some point other firms will adopt the Vanguard shareholder first strategy. They may not want to, uh, but when costs get driven down enough, when the directors wake up to paying huge fees for bad performance, it will finally happen. And I do tell the story in there, my two big attempts to mutualize. I tried try to mutualize Putnam, and I tried to mutualize a, a subsidiary of IBM that ran their money. And in both cases, I fail. Uh, but on the other hand, you're not out until you have three strikes, and that's only two. Uh, so um, I, I believe that the industry will be forced economically to run itself for the fund shareholders and not for management shareholders. That's number one. Number two 
is the fight to save the S&P 500 index. Uh, there are all kinds of forces against it, and it's in, in a sense its own worst enemy. Uh, it's so successful that uh, assets are concentrated and the index funds own very large portions of every company in America and pretty much around the world. And for U.S. companies, uh, Vanguard owns, I think, around 8%. BlackRock owns almost 8%. That's 16. I think I used these numbers earlier. And State Street, about 4 just those index funds. And uh, that's 20%. And if you throw in American funds, they probably own 3 And uh, then you go way down from there. But the concentration of governing power, uh, well, the, the first issue is... Uh, the competitive number of competitors, like should you own all seven airlines? A very serious attempt to say that no mutual fund index or otherwise, but it applies mainly to the index fund, can own more than one company in a given industry. I talked about this briefly in the other day. And uh, that is a fight that somebody better be making. I'm doing it now myself uh, to say it because I think by Commons, Commons agreement, uh, the S&P 500 index fund that we started in 1975 was the greatest advance for uh, serving investors in the history of finance. That seems a little broad, but nobody else can think of any other. And uh, so it, we cannot let that go. But there may be things that have to happen because the other part of the problem, and, and that is concentration of voting power. And there's an article by Dr. John Coates, professor of Harvard Law School, who says, do we really want a country where 12 people, 12 individuals, control the entire corp corporate America? I think he's wrong. It's more like six uh, that are going to end up here, and not 12. And he, may, he says 12 is just a, num a number he picked out of the air. But a very small number of individuals, the chief executives of big money management firms, are going to be able to run corporate America unless something changes. Something will change. There will be change in governing responsibilities, maybe change in the law. Right now it says that uh, no mutual fund can own more than 10% of, uh, of, of any security, voting stock of any company. And, uh, but it only applies to the mutual fund, not to the complex. So it eats, uh, the, the law very easy to get around. Uh, which gets me to the third part of the uh, third issue which is what I call in the book the Investment Company, the, the Financial Institutions Act, excuse me, of, uh, of 2030, number picked out of the air. And that is the Investment Company Act is written basically to, to regulate closed-end investment companies. And it doesn't regulate, regulate institutional investors. It regulates mutual funds and in, in, in um, incremental ways. The mutual funds were never the focus of that act. So we, there were things that were designed for sort of procrusty in bed. Uh, things that were designed for closed-end funds were, were applied to open-end funds. And it also relates to I mean, this litany of uh, problems. It relates to a mutual fund. Well, this isn't a mutual fund, is it? It was in 1940. Most people had just one fund. Uh, and now people have a lot of funds. The regulatory unit should be the mutual fund complex or the management company, and not the mutual fund itself, in my opinion. So that will be a big change. It's going to happen. All these things are going to happen. And uh, I can't tell you why. I can't tell you how. And I certainly can't tell you when. But I can guarantee you, you younger people in the room, who will be here to see it, mark my words. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Do you think, Jack, do you think the market has become more efficient than it was 10 or 20 years ago or less efficient? I believe the market is precisely as efficient it was, as it was 70 years ago. And I picked that 70 years for a reason. And that is, uh, I showed them in, 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 the, in my proposal to start an index fund, I showed directors the, the performance of the average mutual fund. They were all large cap funds then, uh, compared to the S&P 500. And the, the, the uh, mutual fund uh, lost for the, the S&P 500 won by 1.6% a year. 
The article I wrote, which I mentioned to the Financial Analyst Journal of Meta Index Funds, I brought up to date to the previous 35 years to 19, I'm sorry, to 2015 probably. And the gap was exactly the same, 1.6 percentage points. Uh, it, 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 that may be just a happy accident that they're exactly the same number. But it suggests that the, whatever efficiencies there were then, there are now. Whatever management ability was able to, able to overcome it now, it's the same, same as it was then. Uh, th there's no evidence that this institutional market uh, of today is much different than the individual-dominated market of the 30s and 40s and 50s. And why would there be a difference when you know all these? All these institutions are just composed of human beings, and they want to do better than one another. And you know, whether the human beings are institutions or real human beings, uh, the market is going to be quite efficient, but never perfectly efficient. And this is true for the whole every year of the past seventy years, and even before that. Uh, and it's you know, the efficient market hypothesis is right some of the time and wrong some of the time which I think means it's a lousy hypothesis. Mm. Uh, so I don't, see, I don't see any evidence uh, that the market is less efficient or more efficient now. Okay. None. Did I make my position clear? <laughs> if you could travel back in time to give some advice to the 21-year-old Jack Bogle, what would it be? Uh, get into the mutual fund business as soon as you get in, out of college. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, uh, you mentioned China rising. Uh, could you please talk more about this? Well, I'm not an expert on China, but what we see out there is continued population growth, continued substantial GDP growth, uh, which you know it ran up in the 11 or 12 percent annual GDP growth for a while, and now it's down to, I believe, 6 or 7 percent. Very healthy growth continuing. I think those numbers are about right. And uh, you, I see a more enlightened, in some ways, a Chinese government that's prepared to let entrepreneurship uh, play its own role, let business play its own role, uh, and what could get in the way. And then those are things, they basically have a stronger base economic base, population base, than the U.S., and they will gradually catch up and pass us. Uh, I don't think there's really any question about that. Uh, uh, they have dragging them down uh, a tremendous amount of regulation and, and uh, what do I want to say, maybe mind control. You really have to sign on to the Chinese Communist Party if you want to get anywhere, one party. And uh, they're giving that a certain amount of continuity by having a leader who, I think they suspended the rules, uh, that he, they have to leave the leaders change every six years, uh, to give him lifetime. Uh, and and then, I, then I heard some of them taking it away, so I'm not sure exactly where we are on that. But it's a very regimented society, uh, a very debt-ridden society. They have big economic issues uh, in a lot of building that goes on with huge debt, and nobody moves into the buildings. Uh, this is a problem that we faced in America from time to time, and it seems to be a serious problem. But probably the most serious problem is when you, what do we know about China? And that is we don't know a heck of a lot. Uh, they guard their information. They would give you misinformation if they could, and they do give you some misinformation. But sooner or later, you know, when you're playing with a half a dozen or a half a hundred, different economic indicators, it'll be pretty clear which ones have been fussed with and which ones have not. So I think they're coming around a little bit. But I, I think they're powerful potential, uh, short-term problems, and a real risk to world stability. Do you like Vanguard's target retirement funds, and would you recommend them to most investors for their tax advantage accounts? Well, uh, take the easy part. If you want a target date retirement fund, I would lean strongly in favor of Vanguard's. Why? 
because our costs are a fraction, you knew this was coming, a fraction of what the others are charging. Uh, it's a curious paradox. Well, I do not, I, I, I believe, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I believe 40% in equity, in, in equity of 40%, to have 40% of the equity position outside the U.S. is not the right thing to do. And to do it, I mean, I, I think if you like, if you're that sure that non-U.S. will do better than the U.S., um, you know, give people a choice. Say we're going to start a whole series of international target date funds. God knows we got enough funds already. Another 15 or 20 of them won't, won't matter. Uh, 12 of them, I guess. Uh, and... Uh, you you do you decide instead of just saying here's what we're doing in a notice that nobody read because people don't read notices. Uh, that said, all the other so we are not particularly out of line compared to the other target date funds. Uh, T Rowe Price, American Funds, I guess are the next two competitors, uh, and uh, they have heavy international components. I'm just not sure it's forty percent, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. But we're all following pretty much the same strategy. And, and what this makes me reflect on is from the very beginning, I thought the best strategy for investors and for Vanguard, the firm, was to have funds with relative predictability. Uh, so you are never way out of line uh, with your competitors. And you will win on cost uh, if, you, if you really are right in line with your competitors. So if you look at a fund like Windsor and look at other large cap value funds, say, and this is a, maybe not the best example in the world, uh, you're going to find a 99% correlation between our returns. And if you have a 1.5% cost advantage, when you take out lower turnover, lower expense ratio, and no sales load, 1.5% is easy. It's probably too conservative. You'll win by 20% over uh, 10 years, approximately 20%. Over 10 years. If 20%, doing 20% better than the average fund isn't good enough for you, I don't know how to help you, honestly. Uh, so, and you don't get money pouring in at the top when your performance is great. I mean, just think about Magellan, had Magellan Fund, Fidelity Magellan, had this great performance. The money poured in, it got to $110 billion, uh, paying the Johnson family a couple of billion a year. Uh, I don't think they need it that badly, but then they do if they're going to cut their prices on their index funds to zero. <laughs> Couldn't resist that. And, and uh, then it stopped doing well. And now Magellan Fund is, I think, nine, nine billion about right, Mike? Twelve? Uh, I was right around that, so yeah. Okay, well, let's call it ten billion. You could have just said yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mike is such a treasure, i got to say that again. We had such a great time together, and he and I, he takes that in the same, same sense of humor that I offered it out, but uh, that's a hundred billion dollars that's left Magellan Fund, uh, probably more than that because the market has been going up during this period, even though their performance has been bad. A hundred billion dollars worth of disappointed investors. No wonder Fidelity is thinking more about indexing. Uh, and... Uh, so, the idea of being really good must come with the knowledge certain that when you're really good in some periods, you're going to be really bad in others. That's the way of the markets. So, that's a terrible strategy uh, because the money comes in, as I said, high, and then when you, when you let the investor down, it goes out, and you've got a dissatisfied investor who's then probably a dissatisfied general public who knows your company. So that has worked out well with index funds. Our other funds have, I've talked about this before, high relative predictability. And uh, so is high, and, and to, to focus this particular point on the on Ed's question, uh, is this relative predictability uh, for our target date funds relative to our competitors who all have heavy international positions? Or is it relative to a simple U.S. stock bond position. How are investors going to relate to that? Uh, a lot depends on how international does. International, I should say, non-U.S. And, uh, you know, the fact that I wouldn't do it, wouldn't have done it, or wouldn't have done it to such extent, uh, really means nothing, because I'm often wrong. 
if never in doubt. <laughs> Just that. Uh, and uh, so, and there's also no, no magic in a target they fund. I mean, it all looks so simple, but it isn't. There will be periods when you'd be better off having uh, a very high percentage in bonds when you're starting off and a very high percentage in stocks when you're finishing. I mean, that's just the way the market is. It's, it, you just don't know. I mean, it's so logical and sensible and so smart as a way to think about things. But I think not maybe, uh, I wonder at the end of the trail whether the target date fund won't prove to have been uh, offered kind of as a panacea and in the investment business and the mutual fund business. There are no panaceas, let me assure you of that. A lifetime of learning, no panaceas. Okay, the next question is, what are your proudest accomplishments? Well, I think I said this the other day, quoting Sophocles. Did I tell you Sophocles? Well, if you don't remember it, I guess I didn't tell you. <laughs> or maybe you weren't paying attention. Oh, we were paying attention. But he said, uh, one must wait until the evening to enjoy the splendor of the day. And... So you're asking me, in effect, uh, how do I feel about the splendor of the day? What's my biggest accomplishment? But my evening isn't here yet. So I'm going to wait until, you know, I call it a day in this business. And I don't know when that will be. You know, I, I'm going to hang on as long as I can. Uh, I will, as, as you'll see in the book, I will keep right on to the end of the road. And though your day be long, let your heart be strong. Keep right on to the end. If you're tired and weary. I could probably say the whole point. Still carry on till you come to your happy abode and all you've loved and been waiting for will be there at the end of the road. Period. Very nice. Next question is, um, what strategies would you use to avoid the sequence of return risk? There's just no, there's no way to avoid the sequence of returns. Uh, there is one uh, thing that I would advise everybody, which is at least tangentially related to this, and that is when you look at a fund's record, look at this, I mentioned this the other day in connection with the international and the growth and value, put a dollar in the fund and put a dollar in the market and accumulate those dollars each year and then do a one into one chart. So you're not looking at a single unit, like the 10 year, or 20 year, or 30 year performance. You're looking at how it was achieved. And if you see this at the beginning, uh, you'll see it jump right out at you. Probably somebody started a fund with $100,000 and put a whole lot of new issues in it and got way ahead and stayed ahead, <laughs> fell back from that high, uh, but is still way ahead at the end of the game. So, uh, there's the market is going to do what the market does when the market does, uh, and sometimes rationally, and sometimes irrationally. But the reality is, and again coming back to my idea about dividends, and this is slightly a different one, the market is a terrible thing to think about because it has this speculative element in it, which means sometimes it's selling too cheap, cheap, and sometimes it's selling too dear. And what we do know, no, no is that ultimately the return on the stock market, uh, S&P 500, uh, matches the fundamental return of the S&P 500, the dividends, yields, plus the earnings growth it has. Speculation goes, that extra spe spe speculation, and it, but you always come back sooner or later, it may take a while, to the fundamental return that is the return created by business, and that is dividends and earnings growth. And so, you know, we go to the market today and say, it doesn't look so good. And uh, using that particular formula or that particular concept, uh, you're probably right. Uh, but it, it could be, it, I didn't say when on any of these things. And it could be a few years, uh, I don't think much more than that, before the market comes down to its speculative, um, its fundamental value. But right now it's higher. And uh, we know that, and you know, no, but nobody knows when, so you want to be very careful about doing anything about it. 
you know what happens is people look at it now and say it's gonna it's gonna go down to its then probably take about a 25 percent drop or something to get to its normal normalized value fundamental value value of the of the earnings and dividends uh, and uh, if someone looks at it, well I'm gonna get out now and, and then a month passes and two months passes and three months pass and a year and two years and five years and somewhere along the way the investor says I was wrong so I'm gonna go back in that's usually the time <laughs> to get out so I it, it, it if someone the market is the market it's based on opinions of people who are smart and people who are dumb of institutions who are smart and institutions who are dumb of investors who are lucky and investors who are unlucky and they all come out with as a group with the market return and there's just no predicting the sequence that I know of and if there were we wouldn't all be gathered here uh, there wouldn't be anything to do we just the answers would be easy but the answers in the market are never easy and it's very frustrating two-part question what is the best and worst personal financial decisions you've made in your life? Well, that's it. I confess that when I got out of college and started to make a little more than my initial pay of $250 a month and I was able to save a little, I did some investing in individual stock. And they all had great stories and uh, None of them panned out. And when I had a little more money, and I'm not talking about big league money here at all, I had a broker, a friend of mine from Smith Barney, and he liked to call me up and tell me to get out of this and into that. And it wasn't the fact that every single time I should have gotten into that and out of that, <laughs> which is the way the world works, but it was the damn phone calls. It was waste, I was wasting my time talking to a stockbroker when I had much better things to do in, in the office yet. So um, the biggest mistake I was was letting that go on too long, which is probably 10 years. So, uh, I, do, I do own some equities now, always have, and um, basically dominated by, uh, I've been director of any number of companies, maybe five, uh, and uh, I've gotten option stock from each of those, and so I've kept those stocks that I've accumulated there and not sold them. But other than that, I really have very little to do. I did, I mean, just full disclosure, being full disclosure, I did, um, to show my confidence in my son's small cap growth fund, I made a pretty decent investment in that. And it's really done well. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, and, and I think you could say, Ed, that is it really a mistake? A mistake, if a mistake is something you learn from with a small amount of money, it's probably the, it's probably the most brilliant thing that ever happened to you. So um, yeah, that, would, that would be it. I, I, I didn't get the religion adequately. Well, the final question that I have, Jack, is would you please run for president? <laughs> There's an old joke about it, about a, uh, and it has a, it's a Boston joke about a guy's little lisp, but I won't bother you with the whole joke, but his answer was, I won't say yes, and I won't say no, but I will say this, that's the best over I've had today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we can open up to the audience if anybody else has any additional questions. We've got a few more minutes. Hold on until we get a mic back to you. Jack, you thank you so much. Um, yesterday we had a great time at Vanguard and uh, so impressive. I think everyone agrees. Everybody's been talking about it. And the crew members in particular are what make this place so impressive. And they talked again and again about how much they love working at Vanguard and how much they love you as the founder. Could you share, because many of the people here work in business or business leaders, 
how you were able to start that culture that lives on today? Well, that's really a nice question because it comes out of a little bit out of uh, what the events that transpired in my book. And that is, I think I started to say this to you yesterday, and it was originally about landmarks, each step along the way that got Vanguard from the little skeleton company, the biggest company in the world. And there were around 12 of them. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I read the book and I, I thought it was a stinking book. Uh, and, but instead of throwing it away, I added a chapter about human beings. And it's called uh, Caring, the Founder's Legacy. And in that, I tell the story of uh, when we were probably around, let me say, 200 crew members. We started with 28. It occurred to me that we should have a personnel function. It's called HR today, human relations. And we were not, not about, not in those days, oh no, we're not about to hire anybody. We don't have any money to hire anybody. Uh, so we, I decided to get... Uh, an individual in the company uh, to be the, the head of personnel. And her name was Eleanor Zentgraf. She worked in the legal department. I cleared it with her boss, said he thought she should do it. And I came in and said, uh, I tell a story in the book. I say, Eleanor, we want to start a personnel kind of function. Your boss tells me that you would be good at it and could do it. And uh, would you, would you be willing to do that? Whatever you want, Mr. Bogle. This was not, in, in those days, not, uh, an answer I got with some frequency. And uh, I don't get quite that much anymore. <laughs> Uh-oh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, and uh, so I said, well, that's great. and Thank you. And she goes out the door. And then she comes back in. And she says, I want to do whatever you want me to do, Mr. Bogle. But what is it you want me to do? <laughs> And I said, well, you know, that's a really good question. And I haven't thought much about what I want you to do. So let me try this. I want you to hire nice people and make sure they hire nice people. And out she went and did that. So the key is to have people that have at least a, a, a touch of niceness, of human goodness, uh, and even more than that. And yes, you have to have people that know technology, particularly in the, today, that wasn't much time. And you, so you need the technical, which requires very brilliant people. And But even then, you should try and get people who are at least fun to be around, who are committed to the company, committed to their jobs, committed to their fellow crew members. You know, it's amazing how many of these people, I mean, I talked to a lot of them, 25th anniversaries, retirements, Award for Excellence winners. I'm still spending a lot of time which I love, talking to individual crew members or groups of crew members. What do we call those things, Mike? I do team meeting. Team meetings. I do probably three team meetings a week where somebody finds that uh, they want to bring their investment team or their, their whatever team it is uh, in to see me or they get a bigger room and maybe, maybe as many as 20 people. And uh, just I talk to them about anything they want to talk about. Uh, but I think... To the extent, Patty, that uh, what you're saying is a, a valid reflection, uh, I think never underrate uh, the power of trying to be a decent human being. And it's really easy. You know, don't lord it over people. Don't yell at people. I don't usually. Mike's laughing. I never do, really. <laughs> Almost never, uh, hardly ever. Uh, but uh, and uh, for me, uh, the standard is really uh, you build up a reputation for being a decent human being. And I, there, there's a lot of admiration, even love, from our crew members. Uh, and uh, we human beings then try to live up to that reputation. So it's constantly, I mean, I'm making bigger demands on myself every day because the, the reputation grows. But I think it's, I think it's just trying to be an, a, a decent human being who cares about other human beings, uh, whether they're crew members or, for that matter, 
whether they're all the people sitting here in this room. And, uh, you know, if you like other people, and I'm not a big political guy at all. I'm not a big handshaker at all. I'm very introverted. Uh, but I, you know, I enjoy the company of people that share my values, and uh, particularly within the company. And if you can build that kind of a culture, and I never did it, like, consciously. I never thought I have to build a culture. I did what seemed like a natural thing to do. Hire people, be nice people, uh, give them good compensation, uh, have them figure out what, what it is to do. And a lot of them work on the same teams, have worked on the same teams for 25 years. And I, I really like that. They get along well. They come to work. They're happy to go to work on Monday. And, and sometimes even a little sad to leave on Friday. So um, it's it, it comes down to, you know, as, as human beings, if, if we want to do what's right uh, for ourselves and for society, just try and be good to the people around you and make sure that they pick that up from you. It's very easy because they see what happens and have them do handle other people higher or lower in the, in the, in the pecking order with uh, humility and respect and confidence and trust. And, you know, I haven't really tried to explain that before, Patty, but that's the best I can do at the moment. Can I uh, add something to that? As a first-hand witness, when we had our first conference in, uh, with Jack in 2000 in Miami, I was a snowbird, and Jack knew that I had a business in this area. And he invited me to join him when I came back for, for lunch, and, uh, which I did. And Jack's office is, what, a block or so from the uh, galley. Right. And as we were walking across uh, from Jack's office to the galley, would we have 12,000 employees at that time? Something like that. He seems like he knew everyone as we were walking. He was approachable. He seemed to know their names. He asked how Mary was or how Joe was. And when we got to the galley, there is no executive dining room. Jack Absolutely just, not. Jack <laughs> finds an empty table with all of the other employees and sits there. And I think that is... Uh, exactly what we're talking about, what you're talking about, Patty. And uh, can I add one little thing? When Jack talked about how frugal he was in the galley, <laughs> you go through the buffet, uh, through the line, and you pick out your lunch. And we were going to have a salad, and Jack told me to get the light, lightest plate you could find because they charge by the pound. <laughs> Oh, so I had I had to throw that. <laughs> Some of this is actually true. <laughs> Jack, thanks for everything you've been doing. I'm such being a, such a great man. Okay, I'm nervous to ask this question to you. Uh, here's a quote I'm gonna have. Uh, you had said, "Stay the course." Um, you said, "I've said stay the course a thousand times," and I meant it every time. Is the most important single piece of investment wisdom I can give to you. Of course, you read in the book, Stay the Course. But around the year 2000, I think you cut back your equity investments from 70, 80% to 20, 30%, something like that. And he, you have said that ex in extreme valuations, people should consider similar actions. So at that time, the stocks were at 40 times earnings and yielding about 1%, and bond yields were at 7%. My question is, what measures of extreme valuations should we make change the course or change our uh, investments? And how am I supposed to know? A layman like me, how am I supposed to know that? Thank you. Uh, it's not easy to know. Those opportunities don't come along very, rare, very often. Uh, what happened in 2000? was the, something that I don't, I don't know if ever particularly happened before. Uh, the, stock, the yield on the stock market got to 1%, and it, it, that's not a sustainable stock market level at 1%. Uh, Japan got to 1%, Japan got a half to 1%. But the dividend yield is a very important point, a very port, important point in my reasoning. So here we have the stock market looking high, and the yield in the, in the bond market 
was 7%. So that meant you'd double your money in 10 years in bonds, and you could double your money or triple your money in stocks from 1%, but it just didn't seem like a good idea. Uh, so uh, I can't remember exactly what I did, but I think I cut back from around 75% in the stocks to around 50. Very unusual, uh, something I would probably advise people not to do. Uh, it worked well, of course, and uh, there is, and, and this is, uh, I don't want to get too much sentiment into this, but don't forget, I have gone through little bits of hell, health-wise, and uh, you know, my heart was not working well. I wanted to make sure that my, if I departed this orb, uh, that my my portfolio was fairly conservative for my family, and uh, so I even I was having a, an ablation, which is a long process where they run stuff into your heart to try and get it beating properly. It took ten hours, uh, but before I called my lawyer from the from the operating room and said, "Could you get that? Please get down to me. You never sent me the things I should sign to change my will the way I did the other day." And I want to sign him before I get this procedure done. So down she came, and I signed him. And uh, so there is uh, the subtle pressure of an uncertain life uh, that has dictated uh, more of my investment changes uh, than, than you might think. And uh, that's probably stupid, but it is understandable because you're thinking about those that are coming behind you. Anybody else? While we wait, as I walk over there, I'll tell you a story I haven't told everybody here before. An airline pilot flying from one place to another, I don't know where it was, Florida, got off the trip. The flight attendant is, um, we're organizing everybody to get on the van to go somewhere, and he goes, yeah, some guy was in a in coach seat, was sitting in the back of the galley, and he was giving me investment advice. And I said, oh, no, it's a stockbroker, insurance salesman, or somebody like that. He says, yeah, give me his card. And he pulled it out. And it said, John C. Bowles on it. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking about, now, how, how do I get that card? Or should I tell him who it is? And so, so anyway, I said, hey, if you don't want that card, you know, I'll go ahead and take it. And I took it. And then I told him who it was. But on the back of it was Life Strategy Monitor growth, he was advising a flight attendant in the back of the airplane. So that's a, a story I've never told that here before. That's probably what we call apocryphal. <laughs> Jack, I have a question for you. Uh, all of us have been following your mission. We've been trying to get it out to more and more people. We've been following it ourselves. What Are we doing the right thing? Is, is this what you want us to do as Bogleheads? If you could elaborate to all of us, if you were going to give us a mission, what would it be? Well, you know, that's a hard question to answer because I, I think it's you know, unwise for anyone here, including me, to give anybody real advice uh, because we don't know what's going to happen. And you, you, you're judging the questioner uh, per person that asks you the question or, or asks for the advice, uh, you don't understand who that person is. How could you possibly do that? So I like the idea of the Bogleheads Forum where all ideas can be integrated and people that disagree can do this and that. So I think it's participating in a group exercise. And I must say I'm astonished and delighted with the success of the Bogleheads website. And investors love it. They love Taylor's book. Uh, and... Uh, they love, they love my books, too, which are pretty much the same as Taylor's, except longer. And, <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, I think your mission is to do what's right for yourself. And if someone comes to you in need, give them a course that goes down the middle uh, with the knowledge, knowledge, always the knowledge certain, that you don't know what, nobody knows what lies ahead. What worries me about this 25-year, 45-year bull market, which Vanguard has existed, 12% return. Uh, it's not going to happen again, I don't believe. Uh, and uh, I think there's too much, too many people believe that the past is prologue, the future will continue to get these high returns. 
But think about that chart I showed you yesterday, showing the difference between a 4% a return on stocks and a 12% return, where your money doubles in the 12% return every six years and 4% return every 18 years. And look at those lines spread apart. Mm -hmm. it, 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 don't expect it to happen again. Underplay, always underplay uh, the, the, the chance to make uh, big money. It's a, investing is a matter of putting to work money with corporations. I have a lot of worries about our corporations today. Uh, so I, I say this advisedly. I just don't know what else to do. Uh, I worry about the merger trend. Somebody asked about the shrinkage of, of companies in the U.S. Bill Bernstein did yesterday. And uh, that's a serious problem, not a major serious problem, but a serious problem. And so the future is always uncertain. So whatever you, I guess I would like to sum up by saying it, whatever you say to anybody about anything at any time, just make sure to say, but nobody really knows. Or investing is really a hard business. Because our emotions get mixed up with our the reality, you know, with our mathematics, with the the dollars we have in our retirement plans, and I, 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 I think he, I think you should not be quite blunt about it. Try to give investment advice to anybody else without those those edging words. Okay, here's a chance to uh, talk to your financial hero, our financial hero. Let me make my way to the front. Uh, first, I wanted to thank Mike for being such a great help to Jack and to all of us. <laughs> uh, Jack, you mentioned that you read a couple good books a year. Which of the recent good books would you recommend to us? Well, I'm right in the middle of biography of Andrew Jackson by John Meacham called American Lion and uh, I don't get a chance to catch up with it very often. <coughs> Excuse me. And the last really great book I read was, um, and I'm not talking a little bit about the last book, but the last really sensational book, was uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's uh, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft and the New Age of Journalism. And it's a compelling book, uh, but particularly, a little disclaimer here, particularly for me, because I studied and wrote a paper about the new age of journalism back at the turn of the century. Ida Tarbell, and uh, I can't remember the name of the magazine that printed all this stuff. But uh, the journalism was active then, uh, and people listened to journalism then, uh, and uh, they had a powerful role in the public. And so that combination of two really individual, interesting characters. I mean, there's nobody more interesting, I don't think, than Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, just meant for a, a very compelling read. And I, you know, I like bi biographies for, but I, you know, I wouldn't know where to begin. I got, and people send me books all the time, investment books. And I had, a, I, I, and I'm asked to endorse them. And I got one the other day, and I decided I'd give it a shot. I won't mention the name of the author. And I got to about page 150, and it was 550 pages. <laughs> so I wrote back to him and told him my rule. I never endorse a book without reading it. And I was sorry. He just wrote too big a book for me to read. <laughs> he didn't seem very happy. I also warned them, by the way, that my endorsement has never been known, uh, my blurb has never been known to add a single copy of Extra Sales. Not one book. <laughs> ever. Got one on the other side. And also on the personal touch, after we finished the conference last year, I got home and received a note from Jack himself. Uh, very impressive. You talk about the personal touch. Jack, we know how much you enjoy eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And other than whatever's on sale, what is your favorite kind of jelly? <laughs> Grape. <laughs> Well, I think that wraps up the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> On that note,
uh, is Jason, is Jason going to put that in the journal? <laughs> okay, thanks. I was just going to ask you, Jack, as a, a new father and with our second child on the way, um, my wife graciously allowed us to, to call him Jack, call him Little Jack. This is Big Jack, as he's referred to. Uh, but I just want to ask if you could give us a little advice um, on especially as a, as a father, but you had six kids of your own, and you elaborated the relationship that you have with them. Um, that's not something that happens by accident. Um, you have to be an intentional parent. And you don't really see that in society, but in talking with many of you as a first-time attendee, that's something that's pervasive. And my, my compliments to all of you and to you, Jack. But if you could uh, just you know, give the next generation of parents uh, your advice and... Um, you know, what you would, uh, what worked for you in, in developing that relationship with your kids? Well, I've already told you I was an imperfect parent, so I don't know that I'm a good person to answer that. But you know, I'd say, as I do in so many ways, the simple things that matter, Ben. First, love the child, no matter good or bad. Two, set an example. Don't have to explain yourself away. Uh, three, be prepared for some real bumps along the way because almost every child has them, particularly as teenagers. And four, when it comes to try, time to drive a car, don't let them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, uh, the Bogoheads appreciate your every year attending and being and sharing your time with us. We cherish your friendship. Every year we look for some meaningful gift uh, to commemorate your appearance here. And it gets tougher and tougher. I know you don't have any room uh, just to tell the tale. Uh, when I was in Jack's office a few years ago, he had doctorate, uh, honorary doctorate degrees on the floor. Uh, so I know you don't have a lot of room. But this year, uh, uh, from the American Revolutionary War Museum. I think we found something that's meaningful and small. This is a letter opener in the shape of a, an American Revolutionary War sword. And the inscription reads, to Jack Bogle, who revolutionized the mutual fund industry by slashing costs, saving investors billions, the 2018 Bogleheads Conference. Thank you all. You make me happier than ever that I was able to make it and be with you today. And the one thing I want to say, uh, of course it's a highlight of all your admiration and uh, good words and good wishes and selfies, <laughs> and signed books and standing ovations. All that means a tremendous amount to me. But what it means the most to me, at least it's on my mind now, is one of you came up to me and said, I think one of the visitors for the first time, um, what a wonderful group of human beings you are. They came here, they felt comfortable, they felt welcomed, they felt part of the group, uh, they felt it was an openness, uh, everybody was treated as equals, and I think that is an incredible tribute to all of you in this, in this Bogleheads crowd, uh, and that's what really life is all about. So it's a wonderful I man. I'm looking out there and thinking, wow, what, ni what a nice group. So until next year, God bless you all. <laughs>